Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. From the moment the plane struck the towers on that clear blue September morning, more violence seemed inevitable. Having failed to heed the warnings and prevent the attacks, the Bush administration became a war government. We got a war on terror, a Department of Homeland Security, the Patriot Act, color-coded terrorism warnings. And of course, we got not one, but two protracted major ground engagements in Afghanistan and Iraq. Violence that killed nearly a million people, according to Brown University's Costs of War project, including more than 7,000 American service members. Just weeks ago, Americans watched as the longest of its conflicts, Afghanistan, supposedly the good war, reached its ignominious end with the Afghan forces crumbling, the Taliban advancing, and the US scurrying to evacuate its personnel and allies. Osama bin Laden, the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks, had already been dead for a decade. But Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, they live on. So was the war on terror a huge mistake, a failure? Are we safer today than we were two decades ago? I put a version of that question to Captain Florent Groberg, who received a Medal of Honor after he was nearly killed intercepting a suicide bomber in Afghanistan. You fought against these people. You got injured fighting in the quote-unquote war on terror. What is your instinctive reaction when you see stuff like that? I just hope that we never go back. Uh, you know, I, I really hope that um, this new Taliban government uh, follows through with its word and that we don't go back uh, because it's it was a difficult 20 years for all of us. Joining me now are Ali Soufan, former FBI special agent and founder of the Soufan Center. He led the investigation into the Al-Qaeda bombing of the USS Cole the year before 9-11 and was described in a famous New Yorker piece as one of the few people whose work might have come close to preventing 9-11 itself. Also with me is retired U.S. Army Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson and a fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He was Colin Powell's chief of staff at the State Department and served in the Bush administration administration from 2002 to 2005 in that role, after which he became a ferocious critic of Bush's wars. Uh, thank you both for joining me on this special edition of the show. Let me start by asking you both, where were you on 9-11? What were you doing? What was your instant reaction when you heard or saw the news? Colonel Wilkerson first and then Ali. I was just coming back from a brief breakfast briefing uh, downtown in Washington and getting out of the taxi when the radio in the taxi began to announce it. And I told the taxi driver, turn up the radio, please. Let's listen. And we were listening. The second plane had already hit. I was hearing it over the radio for the first time. And I looked up and the black smoke billed over the Pentagon. Um, I thought at the moment, because of the transition briefings that we'd received from Dick Clark and others, Al-Qaeda has struck. Wow. So you even on that day were thinking Al-Qaeda had struck. Well, let me ask you, Ali, you were a man who was th thinking a lot about Al-Qaeda in the run-up to 9-11. Where were you on the day itself? What was your instant reaction as you saw those images on the TV or listened on the radio? I was in Sana'a, Yemen. I was in, uh, uh, in our embassy, and we were planning for some meetings for that evening. Um, and uh, some you know, colleague uh, ran to the office and he said a plane hit the World Trade Center. And at the very beginning, we thought maybe, maybe it's a Cessna plane. And then, you know, soon later, somebody else said, you know, another train, uh, another plane hit the World Trade Center. I had no doubt in my mind that it was Al Qaeda then. Uh, Ali, in that famous Lawrence Wright New Yorker profile on you in 2006, which later became the Looming Tower, you are described, you were described in that piece, it's how a lot of us first came across you, as the only FBI agent in the New York office who spoke Arabic, one of only eight in the country who spoke Arabic. You were the man perhaps most familiar within the Bureau with Osama bin Laden, with Al-Qaeda. You had been tracking them, hunting them. I just wonder, you're in Yemen, you see this news, you're watching the TV. Was there a I saw this coming moment? Was there a, almost a I told you so moment? We could have stopped this moment in your head at that moment? To be honest with you, no. Um, I think when I start to see all the documents later on, and we were, you know, my job is to identify the people who did this, 
and we start seeing their connections to Al Qaeda and the connections of a few of them to the USS Cole investigation, um, I think I was I was feeling more betrayed than than I told you so. I was feeling that if that information was shared with us on a timely basis, maybe maybe the situation yes. could have been different. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, so many people in the intelligence community, so many people in the law enforcement community, realized the threat of Al Qaeda. Realized Al Qaeda was going to hit. Unfortunately, the administration at the time, they did not want to focus on international terrorism at all. You know, even in the FBI, they put uh, international terrorism as like number 15 on the list orders by the Attorney General of the United States at the time. So they wanted to focus on something else, and they thought terrorism is something that's made up. Colonel Wilkerson, you were in the administration at the time, which Ali says didn't put an emphasis on terrorism until 9-11, when suddenly it became the number one issue in America and the world. We know that on the day itself, President Bush, he goes on to Air Force One from the school. Dick Cheney's taken into a special operations bunker. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, he was helping the rescue efforts of the Pentagon, as well as later that day, telling his aides to come up with plans to go off to Iraq. You were, as you say, coming back from a briefing, you were a member of the State Department, you were a close ally of then Secretary of State Colin Powell. What was the mood inside the administration that day? Was it clear to you that day, that night, we were going to war and it was going to be a long war? Let me first say, Mitty, that uh, it's an honor to be on with Ali because he's one of the few people from those days that I have a lot of respect for. Um, what happened immediately, of course, was we went into evacuation. Everybody had to leave. That was that was the orders that came from the White House. Um, Richard Haas, the director of the policy planning staff, though, brought us back in to start planning a strategy for the next day or the following days, whenever Powell would have an opportunity to be brief President Bush. And what happened in the ensuing time after that was Powell presented what I thought was a brilliant strategy for essentially exploiting, and I use that term in a positive sense, the opportunity the glo the, of the global solidarity that had occurred because of all the people who'd come together. Uh, Article 5 of NATO was invoked for the first time. A million Iranians marched by candlelight and so forth. It was a tremendous moment of solidarity. Then the decision-making in that moment of rage and fear began to distort everything. And it became the military instrument that led the way along with the CIA, and those two in tandem were a dangerous combination. And everything else started to deteriorate. All the strategy, purpose that we had in doing things that we needed to do in the world, small and large, doing them everywhere we needed to do them began to fall apart because we distorted it with the rage and the fear out of which this national security decision-making took place. Never a good environment to make monumental decisions, fateful decisions, fear and rage. Ali, one of the themes of this show today, the biggest theme perhaps, is looking at what we've lost, both on 9-11 on the day itself and the decades following it. And given how much we're still living in the shadow of 9-11, how would you answer the question of what we've lost? What would you say we might not ever be able to get back? Well, we lost... Um... We lost our reputation on the international stage. We lost our reputation with our own people. Um, you know, on the eve of uh, the Iraq war, 75% of the American public believed that Saddam was behind 9-11, uh, and that is not true. Uh, we were sold a war against Iraq because of 9-11, uh, you know, and, and, and that war basically gave Al-Qaeda and gave the Taliban and gave many of the people that we were fighting at the time uh, a new life. Um, we lost uh, our uh, moral high ground on the international stage with a torture program that did no harm as it did all harm, but no good. Um, we lost our reputation with our own population when we start doing illegal uh, surveillance programs on the American public, unconstitutional surveillance program. Um, you know, and that lack of trust that it created in the last 20 years between us and between our allies, between us and between our people, uh, resulted in uh, the environment that we live in today. It created people like Donald Trump. Uh, where, um, you know, unfortunately, they capitalize on that uh, lack of trust, that, 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 that broken system that already existed, and we caused it to exist in, in 20 years. 
um, I think it's going to take uh, a lot to to bring back, um, you know, our values, our reputation, the trust of our allies yes. and the people of the world. Um, you know, I think uh, the world. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.